Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is the Daily New... Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the, that never happens from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy. My name is Mark, and on this freshly, semi-freshly ironed <laughs> edition of Collider Movie Talk, we have goons, casting calls, murder? What's up first, Ashley? Tell me who's here. We've also got a special guest, T. Wee! Hey everybody, it's T from Cinefix, and uh, feel like this is my home away from home now, except y'all didn't tell me to wear green, so <laughs> <laughs> clearly I'm not really part of the squad yet. I'll see your Perry number off. That's okay, because Ellis didn't tell me to iron my really cool t-shirt, so I feel like I'm not up to your levels right now. <laughs> also here at Christian Harloff. You gotta earn the green tea, but I earn think you've the, earned it. I, think I mean, earned literally, it. you have to earn the green. That's true. And you have to earn the green. All right, well, Ashley still hasn't uh, done it, because she's messed up. What'd you say, Mew, in the beginning? I don't remember. Mew? It's oh. out of my memory. It blocked it out of my memory. It's fine. Hey, look, even the mighty Casey <laughs> strikes out sometimes. T is gonna be a full-fledged <laughs> member collider when she finally feels comfortable enough to bring her cute puppy by the studio, because yes. we're a very dog friendly Place. Make that happen next time, ow, T. Ow. In the meantime, before we get to our first story on the rundown, we have some breaking news, and it's of the exciting fashion. We have a bunch of new Black Panther images that were just released courtesy of Entertainment Weekly. You guys can go to Collider.com right now and check out all the latest images and some backstory. And look at these gorgeous shots. That is the special forces that is all female in Black Panther. And we also are going to have the, uh, the Warrior Falls. Uh, it's a spiritual place where you go to fight each other and <laughs> that's a great read it's that's a great read it, there's people that are talking and they're Good. making a lot of plans and this is an entertainment weekly shoot people which when things. i first heard that they were doing an entertainment weekly shoot i got a little nervous about it because entertainment weekly when they do a movie shoot sometimes it's okay sometimes it's terminator jenny smith bat and sometimes it's x-men <laughs> apocalypse and people do nothing but make fun of it for three months this is not that case because i love these black panther images that i saw it gives us a little bit of context while still keeping a lot of the mystery alive and that's one of the things that was stressed in the story is that the producer do not want to give away too much. What I really notice is that in one of those Warrior Falls shots where it's you have to chow and he's looking at Michael B. Jordan's character, he has all these raised indentations on his skin and they're talking about how that factors into his backstory, but they don't want to give away too much about this very mysterious Wakanda place or the inhabitants yet. So it's going to be a movie where we're going to find out a lot of stuff about Wakanda, about Black Panther's history, about the MCU going forward. So T, when you see all of these images, which one stands out to you and how do you feel about them? Any and all of them with Michael B. Jordan, who is my future ex-husband. <laughs> um, you digging but yeah, the hair? I'm digging the hair. I'm digging the body, the face. <laughs> pretty much everything. But yeah, I'm actually pretty excited about this because I know I'm in the minority here, but I do have some superhero movie fatigue. But it's just refreshing to see faces that we don't normally see in these types of movies. And I'm really excited to kind of like not know that much about it. You know, they're not showing their total hand. And I like that. That's right, Perry. When you look at uh, uh, it's the, the Dora Milaje is the the all female guardians that, that are like the Wakanda special forces. So you have a cast that we've never seen in a superhero movie before like this, and you have an all female special guard protecting mm -hmm. T'Challa. This looks like this movie is going to be breaking a lot of new ground. Oh, that's for sure. This these images bring me back to that Marvel open house event we went to because at that event they were showing us little bits of so many different movies, so many different stills and artwork, concept art, all that stuff, and my eye was. Was just so immediately drawn to everything Black Panther. And it was largely because, I mean, obviously we hadn't seen any footage at that point, but because of these costumes. Because most of the time when I see an EW cover and I have something to complain about, it's always something along the lines of, oh, they dressed up in their costumes and they're just standing there posing. <laughs> This is different. This is different because that is something we have never seen before. That is something that you can pose them in any which way, and something about it just looks powerful. And it's the same thing with that big group shot where it has all the main cast. And if you haven't, go through that EW article because it breaks it down by character and has so much interesting information. Speaking of which, you can have Michael B. Jordan, and I will take Daniel Kaluuya. That is <laughs> one of the people in this movie that I'm most excited to see because one of my biggest things with Wakanda that I'm so fascinated by is... How do they keep it such a well-hidden secret? And apparently, 
his character is kind of in charge of the front line of defense there, which is about keeping that disguise and kind of masking what it really is. Yeah, Christian, T hit on something interesting because like, even if you don't have superhero fatigue necessarily, even if you love every superhero movie that comes out, we'll get excited for the Infinity Wars and all the big collection, but when you see images like this and it shows such a different backstory that we've never gotten in really any movie, much less a superhero movie, it feels fresh. It does. Well, that's that's kind of my issue with the uh, the superhero fatigue thing. I, I hear it a lot, but I think that that's what, what Marvel has done. I don't think that there you really can get superhero fatigue because it's a different genre. It's a genre now. Superhero movies, there's, it's, there's genres, there's like subgenres to where this movie alone is going to be something completely different than we've seen as where Ant-Man was a very different movie. Um, uh, what, what's uh, the Spider second one? Man. The Spider-Man oh. was like kind of like a yeah. John Hughes type movie and Winter Soldier was a kind of spy thriller. They're switching things up completely. That's why I think that it's just, because it's superhero, it's easy to say there's just too many superhero movies, but when you look at what they do, they've been doing some brand new things. But for me, the thing that I'm most excited about this movie is I am a Ryan Coogler fanboy. I can say it. I can say it all the way to the bank. He's two for two. He Amazing movies. Came out the bat with Fruitvale Station and just knocked me right out of my seat in that movie. Powerful, emotional movie. And then you get what he did with Creed. A lot of people right away were saying, ah, another Rocky movie. Who cares? And it was one of the best movies of the year. And, it, and his directing, obviously, in the performance of Stallone, got Stallone nominated. What is he going to do here? You look because you, he's uh, De Niro, his uh, Scorsese had De Niro, he's got Michael B. Jordan. Right. They work together in every single film. You can tell it right away. He's like, I'm doing Black Panther. I don't care what it is. Sign me up. I'm in. And you can tell it's got this epic feel to it. There's going to be so much that Coogler does here, so much passion he puts into his projects. It's one of my most anticipated movies. I can't wait to see this. Couple it with uh, Lupita Nyongo together. This is gonna be, there's going to be so much. You look at it, it looked, Troy was a pretty shitty movie. For the most part, you know, <laughs> but there's some cool parts of it where Wolfgang Peterson did some cool stuff. It reminded me the way it looked, like certain images. I'm very excited for this movie. It looks a little bit like uh, like, like Themyscira from Wonder Woman, where it's like got this whole backstory and this this mysterious origin that we're not sure what it is and how much that is going to unfold in front of our eyes, how much of it will stay hidden in lore that you go explore in the comic books afterwards. This is one of those movies that's going to come out and drive a lot of people to all the source material that is out there for Black Panther. We're very excited. And you brought up Cougar. There's one of the images that you guys can watch on Quieter.com right now. It actually is of behind the scenes of Coogler talking to some of the cast members, awesome. and you just see how deep this guy goes with actors and actresses. This uh, movie looks like it's going to be something special. So, Ashley, let's move on to our first official topic, which is Quentin Tarantino doing a lighthearted, zany romp. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> According to a report from THR, Quentin Tarantino has been quietly putting together his next movie and is talking to A-list actors for what is described as a unique take on the Manson family murders. The entitled project will be written and directed by Tarantino, with THR saying that the center of the story will be on Sharon Tate, the actress and wife of director Roman Polanski, who was murdered by Manson and his followers in 1969. Sources for THR also say that Tarantino is putting the finishing touches on the script, with Brad Pitt and Jennifer Lawrence both having been approached about the project. The plan is to shoot in the summer of 2018, with a release date still to be determined. Mark, what do you think about a Quentin Tarantino movie about the Manson family murders? I think that with some people, retirement just doesn't take, and Quentin Tarantino is one of those guys where he might say that he feels like hanging it up, but then he gets a story in his brain and he cannot control it. It gets onto the page and eventually onto the screen. And I think this is a great thing for him to adapt. There is a little bit of caution that I have with Tarantino doing something that is so based and rooted in a true story recently. I know that he did Inglorious Bastards, and if you watch that, it doesn't quite stick with the history of <laughs> World War II to a T. I think he'll be more faithful to the actual events that happen, and that's what I'd like to see, because an exploration into the Sharon Tate side of this and watching somebody and a group of people come under the spell of Charles Manson and how all those events unfolded in the late 60s, I think that Quentin Tarantino is the right guy to do this. And then when you hear some of the casting that he's considering, that Brad Pitt might be up for, what role would Brad Pitt be playing? Jennifer Lawrence, according to reports, Jennifer Lawrence is not interested in playing Sharon Tate. So who is she going to be playing? Christian, there's a lot of questions. We have more of those than answers right now. Yeah. But the big headline, Quentin Tarantino back doing a Manson murder movie. What do you think? Well, I mean, he said he was going to do, what, one or two movies before he retired. So I wonder if this is the last one, so he says. But we'll see. I like the idea of him doing something that's not the Tarantino you know, project that he kind of comes up with inside of his head. And it's based off of true events. Yes, he based Inglorious Bastards in World War II, but the majority of that squad and everything that happened in there. Few liberties. Right. Few liberties. But, <laughs> but even the beginning of that movie, as soon as it starts, you're like, oh, this is a Tarantino movie. 
how do they do that in a movie like this? Or do they, at, or does he at all? I'm very curious to see what, uh, he's never really done that before. I'd love to see what this movie looks like to just him kind of locking in, taking a particular script, maybe not going, I don't want to see him, I don't want to see complete Tarantinoisms in a movie like this. And I want to see what he can do on the other side of it. And then I want to see another Tarantino kind of special because that's what gets me into theory. He's one of my, if not my top three directors of all time. Um, so this is interesting. I want to see how, how he does it. If it's something that he's passionate about and wants to do and tell the story, of course I want to see. Harry, are you excited that Tarantino's taking on this project, or do you have any concerns about how he's going to be treating the actual events? I don't know if I can have concerns right now, because I don't know what he's going to do. I mean, you guys kind of explained his track record and what he does with, with either true stories or just historical accuracy, so he could really go any which way with this, and... I think I trust him to do it justice and do it right no matter what he does. And I don't necessarily know if I want a straightforward retelling of this story as maybe another filmmaker would approach it because that's why we love Quentin Tarantino. And it's really interesting because he has that certain little flair or spark to his style where it's weird that I can't really pinpoint what he might do with this story. Whereas let's say, let's say a Tim Burton like, when you put Tim Burton's name with Dumbo, I can already kind of picture what right. that Dumbo might look like. But even though I know Tarantino's style so well, I can't really figure out what he might do with this. But whatever he does, I have a good feeling that it's going to be a solid movie. And, you know, Brad Pitt, you can't really go wrong with that. And I'm eager to see Jennifer Lawrence kind of get back in the game with more meaty roles, I guess just because the I actually liked Passengers more than most. But, you know, I want to see her go back to things like Silver Linings Playbook and stuff like that, stuff that really kind of showcases her as a talent, whereas Passengers and Apocalypse... Didn't do she so scaled much. back of being in the spotlight too, which was good. Well, she, she was starting to mother, get it. What's that? Uh, the Aronofsky movie. No, no, no. I know, but she was. She, we were getting oversaturated. She was with Jennifer Lawrence, And she was. Yeah. She, it was smart for her to kind of pull back a little bit and to do a movie like this with Tarantino would be a smart. Yeah, movie. I think you get out of the shadow of a giant franchise like Hunger Games, and then you can start looking at these smaller roles that you want to take. I can't get the image that Perry brought up of having uh -oh. a double feature of Dumbo and then the Manson <laughs> movie in my head. Like that's a long day at the box wow. office. T, you hear this news about Tarantino taking on this new project what are your thoughts i am a hundred percent intrigued by that with quentin tarantino in a huge sense all of his movies are about him in a very big way um you know it's about his imagination his dialogue his sense of character and either you love that or you don't i love it i, I love a lot of his movies even the ones i don't i still go and see and i'm glad that i saw them so with this it's really interesting because we've never really seen him take on anything that where he has to sort of be respectful of ac actual events i mean obviously in inglorious bastards we're dealing with world war ii but I feel like there was a little bit more freedom there because we're not really talking about particular individuals. We're not portraying specific real people stories. With this, he has a certain responsibility that we've never really seen him had before. So it's going to be interesting to see how he tackles that. The dialogue angle of this is so fascinating right. to me because Charles Manson is a guy who... When he spoke, a lot of people listened to him. The power of psychology is what he used to overwhelm his followers' minds. And Tarantino writes a lot of characters that have that kind of speech pattern where they can be very domineering and commanding when they speak. So him, how much of Manson are we going to see in this movie? That's the most fascinating thing to me. And then obviously, who are they going to cast in these primal roles. Well, remember also that Tarantino wrote um, Natural Born Killers. Mm -hmm. So he, he knows he knows mm -hmm. this world for sure. And then even in uh, Mallory Knox or Mickey Knox in the movie talks about Manson for a little bit too. He's he, he knows about this stuff for sure. I mean, even though he takes to take his name off of that from time to time because he didn't like what Oliver Stone did with it. He wrote it. He knows it. He knows the world. So it'd be very interesting to see. Ashley, you can move us on to our next topic and do whatever you want. Let your heart decide. <laughs> I can show you the world. In an exclusive report from THR, Guy Ritchie <laughs> and Disney Studios are having difficulties finding their lead for the live-action remake of Aladdin. While two big names were mentioned in both Riz Ahmed and Dev Patel, THR is now saying Ritchie and the studio are going back to the drawing board in the hopes of finding an unknown actor that can act and sing and who is Middle Eastern or or Indian. Filmmakers will now go back to dig through the tapes once again, with Disney also bringing on Mary Poppins Returns producer Mark Platt and Chris Montana, an executive music producer on Disney's Frozen. The studio is also eyeing Power Rangers actress Naomi Scott and Tara Sutari 
to play Jasmine, but won't decide until the male lead has been selected since the chemistry is so important to the story. T, thoughts on the troubled casting going on right now with Disney's remake of Aladdin? I'm not surprised at all by the fact that they're having trouble casting because this goes back to an ongoing issue in Hollywood, which is not enough parts for minority actors, which leads to a smaller crop to choose from. You know, you don't have this arsenal, this huge Rolodex of people to choose from. So it's like if Dev Patel isn't interested in or, or available, you basically have to start from scratch. So I'm not really surprised to hear this at all. Hopefully they will be able to find some great unknown, but I feel like with Disney wanting to hedge their bets, they're probably wringing their hands a lot because this is a huge franchise and they might not want to hang their hat on someone who's unproven and untested. Right, and I would dare say that if you're searching for somebody of Middle Eastern or Indian descent, some of those people may not have had the same opportunities that a lot of American actors have had growing up in theater school or being classically trained. So mm -hmm. if you're looking for somebody that can sing and dance, that's a tough thing to do. I applaud Disney for trying to cast this character faithfully to its cartoon source material. And I think that's the, the angle that they should go or else don't do the movie. But sometimes I think that we get a little too caught up in this person needs to be a great singer and a great dancer. And we have, were like we, Russell Crowe. We shy away <laughs> yeah. from the fact Russell Crowe is a great example, though. It's like take a guy like Zac Efron, who was in High School Musical, who who learned to sing for the second High School Musical. You know, he already had the great abs. And then he developed the other parts required to pull that character off or, or even Emma Watson in Beauty and the Beast. I mean, these are people that once they got on set, learned how to handle the character. It's an impossible task that they have. I'm a little disappointed that no news has been announced just because I'm very interested to see what Guy Ritchie is going to do with this Aladdin. I thought, always thought that was like an odd choice. That's a head scratcher. For Aladdin, but I just, you seem like you really want to talk. There's, there's, a, there's a half truth, I think, to all this. I think that there's a half truth. I think that they have a lot of names that they are, that they are looking at. I think that a lot of this has to do with their, Guy Ritchie's not going to direct this movie. I think King Arthur was them going, wait a minute. Um, I think that they can, can absolutely, I think that it's probably been a tough thing to do to cast these actors for sure, because I agree with a lot of, a lot of your points are, are dead on. I think that it's, it's, there aren't enough roles. And so they have this short list that comes out and they go, well, this person, this person, this person. However, I do think that there are so, there's a lot of talented people, whether it's in the, the Bollywood area too. So there's places that they could pull from. And I bet you they have that list and they have looked, but it's a Guy Ritchie situation. I think this is completely, I think this is a cover up. I think this is the fact that it's, it, we have to push things back now. Yeah, you have to push it back and then you can say, oh, Guy Ritchie's not available anymore because that's a nice way to say, because Big deflection. I think so. Mm -hmm. I think that makes a lot of sense because that movie, first of all, I never thought Guy Ritchie was right for this film. I, th I think, like, especially for style-wise, and then I think that when you see what happened with King Arthur, that movie tanked terribly. That is a big risk for Disney to put one of their most popular animated films of all time, transferring it to live action, putting it in the hands of someone whose movies traditionally have not done very well. Look at how many stinkers Guy Ritchie has had. There's a lot. Whether I mean, You may like Man from U.N.C.L.E., didn't do very well. Want to talk about Swept Away? There's a lot of different movies that he's done that just, if I'm in the studio, I'm saying thank you very much, but no thanks. Perry, I, I think that when you look at Aladdin, it might be the hardest of any Disney animated film to adapt to the big screen when you combine the source material, then you also have this incredible role that Robin Williams gave us as the gene, and you have to recapture all this magic and nostalgia. You could have them wanting to push it, or you could have this being a cover-up in a different way, where they have their big convention this weekend, is D23, and what if they came on stage and said, oh, by the way, we have found our Aladdin, here's our Aladdin, and here's our Jasmine. I could see it going either way, but according to this story, it looks like they're really having a hard time coming up with those names. I'm happy that my mind went in that direction and not in the no Guy Ritchie direction that I happen to have think, oh, they're just covering it up to unveil something positive at D23. Because I, I can understand why they might wind up in a situation where they pulled Guy Ritchie off the movie for whatever reason and covered it up however they want to. But I wouldn't think he deserves it. And even though when that pairing was first announced, I didn't think he was right for Aladdin, even though his movies don't do well, he has still proven himself a very capable director. And even though King Arthur did not do well, I enjoyed it. And I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt on this, especially when these adaptations are so, so important to such a big studio that I feel like there'd be enough people around him to guide him in the right direction to make sure it is a faithful adaptation as much as it needs to be. And 
as much as I do want to think that maybe they're covering it up and we'll get some sort of announcement at D23, I kind of take this article at face value, and I think it's it's because of what T brought up. It, the reason that this is a problem is because the Rolodex is only so big. I'm not saying it's impossible to cast faithfully like that, but it takes a lot more work, and maybe that's something that they thought that they were ready to do. They couldn't cast a wide enough net to truly find unknown actors, because all I kept hearing with Aladdin was, oh, we're going to cast unknowns. And then I read this article, and I recognize a lot of those names. Mm -hmm. What happened to unknowns? It can't, I mean, really, in the billions of people that live on planet Earth, I guarantee you there's somebody out there that fits these roles that can sing, act, and dance. That's why and I don't buy it. it. That's why I don't it's, buy it. it. Which is a reasonable I think it, response. If that would be the case, which I, I don't think it is, but if that was the case, I would say shame on Disney. I think that's such a cowardly move no, no, to no, throw all these hard. people auditioning under the bus because you don't have a cool PR way to fire your director no, no, I right think it, now. I think it's a matter, it's not just a firing. I think that there's, it certainly has been difficult, but I just think that they have been, they're going to take some more time. I think a lot of it could be par partially true for sure that they're going to be taking more time to fire it, but I just think like, oh, there's no one out there. Maybe they haven't found it yet. Look, in in sillier roles like Anakin Skywalker in The Phantom Menace, that took forever. Harry Potter. Harry Potter. All these movies. There's a lot of movies that from all over different races take a long time to cast and cast unknowns. So it's just a matter. I do think that partially part of it is let's take some more time and then it, it is an easy way out also. I don't think it's the only reason why, but I think it has a, part, a, a big reason. They also are not in a situation where they can cast someone with only two of those three skill sets because if it does stick with that start date, I think, what did, what did it say, end of August, beginning of September, something, they only pushed it by like a month. They can't teach someone the level of skill you would need to pull this off in that right. time span. And whatever article is the source article also said that Will Smith is confirmed now for the genie, so <laughs> I'm sure that Disney does not want to lose him in the process. Well, somewhere out there is our Aladdin. Unfortunately, somewhere out there is a song from the the, the Fible movie, and that's not <laughs> an American <laughs> tale. Disney yes. property, so uh, no luck there. <laughs> Let's move on to buy or sell. This is the part of the show where Ashley is going to give us a premise, and we will simply say whether we buy it or sell it and use our actual real money. <laughs> According to Deadline, The Shallows' Helmer Jama Colette Sarah has emerged as the frontrunner to direct Suicide Squad 2. The studio has looked at a number of filmmakers, Mel Gibson included, but sources for Deadline say the studio is now focused on Colette Sarah to take the reins of the franchise that will see Will Smith and Margot Robbie return in the ensemble. No word yet on other casts or how close Colette Sarah is to a deal. A release date for Suicide Squad 2 has not been determined. Perry, buy or sell Jama Collette Sarah directing Suicide Squad 2. I am going to buy it. And surprisingly, a wholehearted buy because I'm a pretty big fan of this guy. I think it's one heck of an accomplishment when you've made as many films as he had. And they're all good. I wouldn't say any are mind-blowingly amazing where you're like, oh, get him to direct every single property. And I don't really think that many of the movies he's made has highlighted you know, a really unique style. But he has very competently directed a lot of really solid films. I mean, so many Liam Neeson movies. He had The Shallows last year that I really liked. I think this is probably an appropriate pairing in that you have someone who probably works really, who definitely works really well with Warner Brothers. I think a lot of those movies were made with yeah. Warner Brothers. He can play nice with the, with the people involved, and he has a known track record now for delivering, you know, really solid thrillers, so why not have him on board? And even though I was excited about just, like, the crazy idea of seeing a Mel Gibson-directed Suicide Squad 2, this is probably the smarter, safer choice. He's been uh, rumored as the front runner for a little bit now. Then a new report is reaffirming that rumor that he could be the front runner. So we're going to say whether we buy or sell him actually directing the project. Like if you want to see him, and Perry clearly does. I'm not so sure. I I, I think I'm going to have to sell this as of right now, Perry. I, I thought Orphan was great. I loved Orphan. It was a great twist. Nonstop was a cool 90s action movie throwback, but it didn't really pay off the way I wanted it to. And nothing about watching Nonstop made me say this guy needs to do the new Suicide Squad movie and the same could be said for The Shallows there's a lot of neat directorial tricks that he used in that and obviously I'm gonna really get excited about a shark movie remember with the wave and the shark and you can see the shadow I just don't think that Suicide Squad 2 is going to be a property that I would get excited about seeing him be the director. Now, having said that, I don't know that there is a director you could say that would get me all that excited for a Suicide Squad 2 because that first movie had a lot of promise and I was enjoying it for a while and the way that it got taken into such a 
horrendous direction in the third act really soured me on seeing any more of this. Christian, do you think that, that Mikolet Sayre is the right guy to take this in a new direction? Um, look, I, I actually I had the pleasure of working with Jama when I uh, was at Silver Pictures. His, one of the first movies he did was House of Wax when he was over there, too. And that's kind of what, and he is, he's a Warner Brothers darling. They love him over there. And he's a great guy, and he's, he's a ballsy filmmaker. I like what he does with his movies. I'm going to sell it, though. I think that, I think Suicide Squad 2 needs a director, does need a director that is, because the first one, for the most part, was terrible. It was a bad music video all, all, all the way through. And, and I like David Ayer, but I think that the movie needs a director to kick down the doors and say, holy crap, this is going to be a Mel Gibson movie. This is going to be, not this would happen, but a Nolan movie or a Tarantino movie. And he's a big name behind it for a director, I think, because it changes the style. He'll make a capable movie. There's no doubt about it. It's not going to be a terrible movie, and he'll get away from the, the music video style of it, and he'll tell a story. For that... If I was just buying that, then yes. But I think Suicide Squad 2, especially after the success of Wonder Woman, needs to kick your ass. And I think it needs a director that's going to really do that. I think he'll make a good movie, but I think I want a director that's going to just knock the walls down. Two sells, one by T. We're going to gang up on Perry, or you're going to even the teams? I'm afraid I am going to continue ganging up on Perry. I agree with pretty much everything Christian said. You kind of stole my juice there, Sorry. because I agree. <laughs> they need a director who's much more, of it, an, an, much more of an established visionary and established brand. While this guy does have somewhat of a track record, it's that same trend of these studios hiring directors who don't necessarily have a ton of high-profile credits under their belt, so it means the studio is backseat directing the entire movie and they already screwed it up one time so unless they bring on someone who is a quentin tarantino or you know of that ilk i'm not interested mel gibson's another guy they were looking at is that <laughs> is that the the level of establishment you want or is that going in a different direction i mean that comes with a lot of baggage <laughs> <laughs> mel gibson but i think in terms of that caliber yes I mean, it's it's something that I think that the DC, hopefully DC, is taking a step back with Wonder Woman because it does appear that that was more of them allowing Patty Jenkins to to make her movie and fit it into the DCU, and it'd be great to see that going forward. But there have been a lot of directors that are of a higher profile that got hired by DC that no longer are doing DC movies, but now you have Joss Whedon doing Batgirl, and it you know if they bring in somebody like John Michelet Sarah be interesting for sure i just think there's somebody out there that could be better well that's why i'm kind of leaning towards it given how many stories we cover lately where it's really big directors that everyone's excited about that have really distinct styles and then it doesn't pan out maybe the key to making these cinematic universe movies work and fit into the the whole is to have someone who can play nice with a whole team rather than just focus on making that their way. I think David Ayer was that guy, though, too. I mean, David Ayer and Jean-Michel Serra have a, a very similar kind of, you know, career, and that didn't really work out that good. And I think T's absolutely right. I think that the studio knows that they can kind of say, we want this kind of movie, just do this. Is where you put Mel Gibson in there. It's like you're getting a Mel Gibson movie. And I don't know how he... Obviously, I think he has good, good relationships with studios in general, because, and he has a good st uh, relationship with Warner Brothers. And Hacksaw Ridge was really good. Braveheart is one of my favorite movies of all time. He comes with a lot of baggage. Yeah. You, you are absolutely correct. But it looks like, as we say many times, this town, uh, this business is very forgiving. And we'll see what happens. If he has made some changes, I would like to see Mel Gibson get this, get this role. Okay, you know what, get Perry? Your drama. guy can direct Suicide Squad too, but he's got to put a great white shark in it. Oh, I'm fine with that. Our next story involves Clint Eastwood. What's he doing, Ashley? According to a report from Variety, Clint Eastwood has tapped Anthony Sadler, Alex Scarlatos, and Spencer Stone to play themselves in his next movie, The 1517 to Paris. The film will tell the story of the three Americans who stopped a terrorist on a train bound for Paris. Jenna Fisher, Judy Greer, and Ray Corisani will also join the real-life heroes in the film, with three young actors also cast to play the younger versions of Sadler, Scarlatos, and Stone. So Sources for Variety say the real-life men will have good-sized roles in the film, but the story is expected to begin during their childhood, showing their friendship leading up to the moment that changed their lives. A release date has not been determined. Christian, buy or sell the casting of real-life soldiers for Eastwood, the 1517 to Paris. Oh, I'm so torn on this one. I mean, I, I want to buy it because I like the idea of, of telling the story and the fact that what these guys did and giving them a chance to actually, I mean, whether or not they want to relive it and do it again, but I think showing them as kids is really cool. My problem right now is Clint Eastwood, is that Clint Eastwood, especially these are, how sizable the roles are going to be. The problem is 
if you look at a movie like um, Jersey Boys, right? Oh boy, do we have to? Exactly. <laughs> the the he got a lot of those actors that did the actual play, the Broadway play, but it didn't work. That you could clearly tell they were Broadway actors trying to be film actors because Clint Eastwood does like one take and you're done. Good, wrap it, done, and like. That could be that could be a problematic for people who have never acted before. But, and the other thing is, I haven't gotten very excited for his storytelling lately. I didn't really love American Sniper. I know a lot of people did. I didn't really, you know, minus the the fake baby. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> but there are certain. T- I mean, there are certain things that he does now that I just I, I don't know. It's too rapid fire. But again, I, I'm I'm going back to. I really do want to see this story on film. I think it's a story that should be told. I like the idea of trying to incorporate these guys if it can work. It's just right now, I know he's a legend, but I'm just, I'm a little scared of Eastwood. So just a minor sell. Fake babies are the only babies. I'm going to buy this because I, 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 I share your concern that Clint Eastwood is just not one of those directors that is going to work with actors a whole lot, where he allows the actors to, here, interpret the scene the way you want. And when that is, you know, Sean Penn and Tim Robbins in Mystic River, good. It's probably going to work out well. If it's somebody who's never acted professionally before, you may have some issues there. But having said that, remember that Navy SEAL movie that came out a few... Remember, it, it was a couple years ago, and it was, it was starring Act real Navy SEAL Team 6, I think. Yeah, yeah. Oh. It was, was, it was, was it Active Hour? I think it was Active Hour. Va- it was, oh, maybe. It was yes, Active Hour. It was starring yes, members of SEAL Team 6. Yep. And they're actual, there's one scene in there where one of the real Navy SEALs, like they do the cool Navy SEAL stuff, then this guy starts interrogating this dude. And he's like a really good actor. And he's, he's an actual Navy SEAL. And it's like, if you can do that pr- level of performance with this story that I think, I remember, I remember when this news broke, following along with what these brave humans did to stop this terrorist act. I want to see that on the big screen. I love the backstory, so it's going to be a buy. And maybe my excitement for the project and the fact that Clint Eastwood has done some really good war-related movies in the past. He clearly likes to honor uh, people who have served. I think that this is going to be one of his good ones, a lot like what Sully was. Right. So see, if, if this can be the level of Sully, I'm going to be as happy as a pig in slot, Perry. Oh, I didn't love Sully. Um, I, I liked it well enough, just like I've liked almost every movie, minus Jersey Boys, that Clint Eastwood has directed. But I think I'm going to have to sell this. I like the idea of him incorporating them more so than I like the potential that it actually has, just because, I mean, I can't judge them as actors because I've never seen them act in anything. And the part of the story that had me really nervous is when I read that they did a wide range casting search and then it's something like in the 11th hour, they're like, oh, let's put these guys in the role. You know, like imagine if that's the approach that they wound up taking with Aladdin. It's like, oh, we did that wide wide range search. Let's just cast, you know, so-and-so because we have them here. I don't know if that's necessarily his thought process and how it worked, but I, it's, it's just a risk you take when you cast non-actors in a movie like this. But then again, you have to look at the fact that this is these aren't the main characters. The pieces all say that it's going to span their whole lives and these are just not the main roles. So maybe it won't have that much of an impact on the movie. And in that case, maybe the fact that they've really lived through this will will impact it in a positive manner. I don't know, but if I was part of this production, I would be doubtful of casting unknown actors, non-actors. See, we have varying levels of concern and then Perry has some doubt about this. How are you feeling? I'm buying it, but I'm also buying one grain of salt. Uh, I don't, I mean, you pointed out the Navy SEAL movie from a few years ago where they used the real guys. I think that there's there's always potential for civilians, you know, real people to end up being good actors, but it's always kind of a pleasant surprise if they're completely inexperienced. So you run that risk, and the same is true here. I'm fine with taking that risk. I don't even know if I fully believe that whole story of, oh, we had a whole search and then we decided on these guys. I feel like that sounds like PR bullshit to me, quite honestly. (laughs) Uh, Like, oh, you know, like we decided this was the best way to go. I think that's marketing. But I do think it's cool that they're letting these guys play themselves, even if it is only for a small portion of the movie, because it is a little bit tacky sometimes when you see like what the real person is like and then they cast Ben Affleck or whoever. (laughs) So I'm going to buy it, but I am a little nervous, like Christian was saying about Clint Eastwood, because I didn't love Sully, and I didn't love um, American Sniper either. So I'm I'm not sure if he's on his game quite the way he was earlier in his directing career, but hopefully he's getting back on it. 
It is a little jarring when you see a movie that is uh, based on a true story and it's like starring actors. Then at the end, they show pictures of the real human. <laughs> it's like, oh, I love that. Oh, that's what. Oh, jeez. That's yeah. A, whew, all right. Yeah, they uh, they cast it up. OK, Ashley, we've got one more buyer. So let's talk Stifler and hot dogs. Yeah. EW has debuted the all new trailer and poster for the sequel, Goon Last of the Enforcers. After a pro lockout reunites old teammates of the Halifax Highlanders, notably missing from the lineup is everyone's favorite Enforcer Doug the Thug Glatt. Sidelined after one too many hits and now married with a baby on the way, Doug is hanging up his skates and settling into his new life as an insurance salesman. But when Doug's nemesis is made captain of the Highlanders, Doug is compelled back into action. The movie is directed by and co-written by Jay Baruchel and stars Sean William Scott, Wyatt Russell, Alicia Cuthbert, and Liv Schreiber. It hits select, it hits select theaters on September 1st. Mark Byers saw the new trailer and poster for Goon last of the enforcers i'm buying it man i like the cast the trailer made me laugh it's good to see them back in action and i have good memories of this movie watching it with this lug over here we came over to your place we watched it on vod it was a good time it was a sports movie that surprised us it had a uh, an odd emotional tug that we didn't really expect and also a lot of just like good gut punch laughs literally and figuratively so it's an easy buy for me yeah i'm gonna buy it um i really enjoyed the first one and what makes me nervous about the second one is what I thought the first one was going to be. It looks a little bit more over-the-top comedy than the first one was. The first one was a little bit more of a drama. It had comedic moments, but it was a, it was a drama at its heart. Um, and I, I'm curious about the switch in directors. I mean, Jay Baruchel was in the first one, so he clearly knows the story. He co-wrote the, the first one. So I want to see how it transfers over, but I did like the story. I want to see how it continues. I like the idea that they took this guy now and he's like on his tail end out and he was not the badass that he used to be and he's got to go after his old rival to kind of train him. It's very Rocky 3. Uh, Creed gets to uh, train Rocky before his last battle. I, I, I enjoy is that. There a, is there a movie that's come out that you cannot compare no, to Rocky? No, it's a thing I was taught as a kid to compare everything to Rocky. I'll teach you about chocolate chip ice cream. It works too. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to buy it, but I could see where it could be just a silly comedy. Okay, I hope it's not. We're going to come back to because I want to know which okay. Rocky movie is chocolate chip. Uh, T, in the meantime, do you buy or sell the Goon trailer? Uh, just based on this trailer, not having seen the first one, I'm going to sell it. I agree it looks a little slapsticky for my taste, but what I will do is I'm going to buy the first one used since it's been out a while because uh, based on <laughs> what you guys were saying this morning about it, it sounds kind of cool. I think I'd like to go check that out. It sounds a lot more up my alley. Yeah, I think I, I think people out there, if you didn't see Goon, it was in very limited release when it came out. Then it was a bigger hit on VOD. Yeah. Check it out. I, I think it will surprise you. Uh, Perry, were you surprised by the first Goon? And do you want to see this one? I was. I love the first Goon. And I liked the idea of getting a second one. But I think the, the ship has kind of sailed for me. So when I watched this trailer, I wanted to see something that made me get all excited for another Goon movie again. And I think this trailer was missing that. And I'm also going to sell it because I think it was just a poorly cut trailer that kind of threw a whole bunch of plot points in your sure. face and I know this is going to sound like I'm picking on one teeny tiny detail but if you go to the goon trailer go to the 54 second mark oh boy. and it fades <laughs> it fades to black and it has a hot second where it's just black and then it comes back, that to me is just a telltale sign of not knowing how to construct a story in a trailer. You and I are going to have some <laughs> words after this show is done. Uh, Christian, which Rocky movie is chocolate chip? Rocky 2, because sometimes you can't tell if it's better than just any other ice cream. Sometimes chocolate chip is the best ice cream out there, but uh, sometimes it's not. <laughs> Gotta be honest, you'd never disappoint me. Thank All you. right, before we move on to mailbag, I want to remind you guys that at the end of the show, we're going to save a little bit of room for your live Twitter questions. Go ahead and start tweeting us right now at Collider Video. Wendy is our beloved gatekeeper, and we also have some cool stuff on the Collider Video channel. Right now, you guys can check out the new comic book Shopping with John Schnepp and special guest Martin Starr from the new Spider Man Homecoming movie. Here's a sneak peek. Hey, what's up, sweaties? It's a brand new episode of Comic Book Shopping. I'm here with Martin Starr, that's right, from Freaks and Geeks, Silicon Valley, and the brand new Spider-Man Homecoming. Hey, let's talk about some Spider-Man comics. Just check out some of this artwork. There's more breasts and butts. Mm-hmm. Sounds great. Now, I never thought I'd ever recommend something this stupid in my life, but this is incredible. Have you ever thought about being a comic book salesman? You like to buy comics? Kind of. With people? I do. In front of cameras? I do. Perfect. <laughs> I never thought I'd say this, but Ashley Mova and Martin Starr shop at the same store. He's rocking a Beavis and Butthead shirt, yeah. too. Speaking of John Schnepp, we're doing Collider Heroes every day 
this week. You get tasty little 15 to 20 minute morsels of John Schnepp and company talking about all things in the world of comic books and comic book movies. And we also had a big event happen in the team league of the movie trivia showdown that went down yesterday. Christian, what's up with the horsemen? Well, just we took a break from matches because we had the big collision that aired on uh, Friday with both parts. And then John Roca, Matt Nose, Robert Meyer Burnett, we had a little interview with them that talked to William Bibiani. Go ahead and check that out. But this Friday, we've got Nost versus Dagnino. I am surprised that this table is still, still standing in yep. working condition. Uh, also, prepare ye selves for Game of Thrones. Ga Thrones Talk is the name of the show on Collider Video. Ken Knapsack is going to be leading a panel that is going to be talking about every episode of Game of Thrones. I believe that this Sunday is going to be the premiere. And then from then on, each subsequent episode of Game of Thrones is going to air on Sunday. And then they'll do the recap on Monday. So make sure you guys stay right here for Thrones Talk. And obviously, every Friday, is a new awesome tack you're starring jeremy johns you guys can get the link to the latest episode in this vid's description comic-con is next week ladies and gentlemen and we have a lot of announcements we're going to be making later on in the week and all we can tell you right now is are we going to be meeting and greeting a lot of you folks you're damn right we are we might have some other surprises in store so just make sure that if you're hanging around san diego whether you have a badge or not you clear your calendar Thursday afternoon is a good thing to aim for, and then you can go check out the rest of the festivities that weekend. But Thursday, pretty good day. You may want to hold open. And I'll be doing some stand-up down there Wednesday night as well. So we'll see all your smiling faces down there. And with that, let's move on to Mailbag. This is the part of the show where you guys wrote us letters with stationery and a fancy pen, and Ashley Mova is going to answer one of them. Anytime you guys can email us, collidervideo at gmail.com. We'll answer it either on Movie Talk or on our weekend show's Mailbag. And please... Just for the sake of Mark Riley's <laughs> mental sanity, maybe try to steer away from a Star Wars or a Marvel or a DC question and see what else you could come up with. Ashley, what do we got? Jeff Parkinson writes, if you could pick a movie from the last five years to take back in time to show an audience in a 1940s, 1950s movie theater, what movie would you bring with you to make their jaws drop and minds blown? For me, I would have to pick Interstellar. Man, you said jaws drop, and I just want to bring jaws, but that's mm. from 1975, so can't really do that. Perry, what's a visually stunning movie that you would throw in an old-timey theater? I think I'm going with Inside Out, because at the time, that was the rise of classic Disney animation and could you imagine if folks back then saw what Pixar was doing now so I'm going inside out that would uh, blow some minds Christian you're giggling you're like a schoolboy nervous. I just thought about it I was like I could show any audience in 1940s 1950s sneak in put a movie in and take off Nymphomaniac 1 and 2 they would be able to handle it <laughs> <laughs> oh, they would be able to handle it <laughs> Lars Van Trier let's do it see what happens I don't run out giggling a lot of, a lot of fans <laughs> wiping off sweat that was so funny to watch uh, it's a long movie too uh, T what do you pick in here uh, my pick and this is not just because I'm looking around at things in the room and naming them but I'm gonna go with dawn <laughs> of the planet of the apes wow. uh, ah, I like it the apes franchise is fresh in my mind because I just saw war for the planet of the apes Rise, uh, not rise dawn really really visually stunning the effects from rise to dawn improved so drastically and just the image of an ape on a horse with an assault rifle I think everyone in that <laughs> audience's head would explode it's a tough call I like the interstellar like, where you're just going to shock people and so you could pick some like huge comic book movie explosion i'm picking Step Brothers. it's hilarious watch <laughs> it 1940s and 1950s laugh on a big screen it's going to be a joy did you get a chance to answer oh yeah, yeah you had Nymphomaniac. Nymphomaniac. One or two volumes one and two so let's transition out of that and into live twitter questions wendy we got some time for a few of them what are they saying on the twitter today well here's one from frank torres who writes how do y'all feel about having a sequel slash reboot slash remake to the mighty ducks franchise would it work for the kids Yes. <laughs> oh, man, the legendary Gordon Bombay, who had a little toasty one night and ended up winning all of our hearts in early 90s Disney movies. I'm a big Emilio Estevez fan. He could come back. I think you could I think you could do a reboot of the Mighty Ducks, not the least of which for reasons is that there's still a team called the Mighty Ducks, and sometimes they play pretty well. The Anaheim Ducks had a good season. T, I think that it could be ready for a reboot. Would you accept that? You know, I actually would. There tends to be a lot of resistance when people do reboots, especially with our generation, when it's things that we saw when we were kids. We're like, no, you're ruining my childhood. With this, I feel like it's kind of like Menudo. Just switch in a new batch. It'll be fine. <laughs> ah, nice. This, that's the first Menudo reference <laughs> ever. That's what I'm here for. Reaching well deep done. into the boy band vault. <laughs> yeah. Coming out great. with a diamond. Perry, 
Mighty yeah. Ducks, I know you love that. Of course, I love the Mighty Ducks. I want more Mighty Ducks. And I feel like we have like just a lack of kids' sports movies nowadays. Like I grew up with Mighty Ducks, Little Giants, Big Green, Sandlot. Where are all those kinds of movies now? That's right, Christian, if you're done making 1940s audiences sweat, right. do you want to see the Mighty Ducks? <laughs> do I want to see it? Not really, but do I think that it could be made? In sure, absolutely. I think that, look, they've done it with the Bad News Bears a billion times. Why not do it with the Ducks? And I think... If you look at a show like uh, Stranger Things, granted, very different audience, um, <laughs> but you can you can really put together a nice ensemble of kids. There are a lot of great kid actors out there that could make this particular reboot work for sure. Mighty Ducks, I think it's going to be making a lot of money for Disney one of these days. Maybe we get that announcement this weekend. All right, Wendy, what's up next? This next one comes from Scott Curtis, who writes, what two films would you like to see in the same story universe? For me, it would be The Witch and The Autopsy of Jane Doe. <laughs> Oh, that's good. That's really good. Like a horror kind of thing. Wait, 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 what's yours? I was going to say, you take uh, Southpaw, um, Billy Hope, and have him fight Adonis Creed. Hmm. That'd be a great one. So, I mean, I know a lot of people didn't. I love I actually really like Southpaw, but I think you have that character going up against Creed. It'd be cool. I'm noticing a trend here, Perry. It's that people kind of sticking in their wheelhouses with their favorite genre. So Christian's going boxing. The author of this question, clearly a big horror fan. So are you. So naturally, my mind went immediately to horror. And because I just saw Wish Upon and it had Final Destination vibes to me, I'm going to say Final Destination. So then I started thinking about ensembles I would like to see in a Final Destination situation and for some reason then my mind went back to the sandlot could you imagine those kids uh, that's not appropriate but right. you know what i mean like a, like an ensemble or a group that i love getting picked off one by one i'm yeah i'm terrible <laughs> kill the I'm kids from the sandlot i'm a terrible person that's dark yeah. that's dark <laughs> wow okay kill me small please, please. <laughs> yeah, there you go. that's the tagline <laughs> 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 Well, I say this one with a huge caveat because I haven't actually seen All Eyes on Me yet. It was released while I was overseas and I'm a little behind on some of my movies that are out right now. But considering they had the same actor who played Biggie in the Biggie movie, mm -hmm. Notorious, in this movie, I want them to bring this together with the uh, Straight Outta Compton cast. And I want to see a movie with all of these actors in one movie. So it's an odd choice, but I would definitely love to see that. I'm going to have uh, Jaws and Free Willy in the same universe. Oh. And I'm going to open with a <laughs> short that is Johnny Five and the Terminator. Just going to be a little five-minute movie, and I think we know who's winning. Johnny Five, <laughs> alive no more. I've never liked that robot hey. at all. Let's do one more Twitter question and close up shop, Wendy. All right, this one comes from Albert, who writes, would you like to, who would you like to see cast as Charles Manson? For me, it would be Miles Teller. Miles Ooh. Teller is not a bad choice. The dude really commits to the roles. You need somebody like that. I think that in years past, you could have somebody like Jared Leto, who's actually played similar characters. Um... I wonder if if they're circling Brad Pitt, who's worked with Tarantino before. I think that Christoph Waltz has that look, but I think he's probably might be a little too old now. He's also worked well with Tarantino. Who do you got? I'll tell you what. I, you get, go somebody who can go off character. I think Miles Teller is too tall, and, and he would... It's Miles Teller. Jake Johnson, I think, would be somebody. If he grew his hair out, put that beard on him, I think Jake Johnson would be a very interesting... Um, choice for that role. Yeah, you know, it, you, you look at guys who are comedic actors, they're known for their comedy, and then they can expand their horizons into something really serious and dramatic. Martin Starr, we just saw Martin Starr. He's, he's, <laughs> he's, he's got the hair he's, for he's, it. Yeah. He's, he, I mean, <laughs> a lot of people have that look. Now, it's not, it's not singular to Charles Manson, but I think Martin Starr could pull it off, and he's really good in Homecoming. Who's your choice, T? Ben Foster. Oh, that's Ooh. good. Good one. Yeah. Damn it, that's that good. I, good I don't know where I pulled that from, but my lizard brain, he just ran to the front of my mind. <laughs> and I'm like, this is the guy. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember when he was in uh, Hostage? He was the creepiest thing in that movie with yeah. Bruce Willis. And he had the long hair. Oh, man, he creeped me out there. But I'm going Jack Rayner. I feel like he, he needs some, some high-profile project to land in his lap right now because he was really freaking good in Free Fire, Sing so Street. good in Sing Street, yeah. too. I think he deserves a shot. That's right. All right, we'll have to keep our eyes on that, and that is going to do it for us today on Collider Movie Talk. I want to thank all you guys for joining us. Please leave your comments and let us know what you thought about all the news stories in today's episode. Thank you to our hardworking crew behind the scenes, Cody and Adam, and the panelists up here with me. First of all, T, where can the kids find you? You guys can find me on Cinefit as always and you can also find me on my personal YouTube channel which is called Nappy Headed Jojoba and try spelling that good luck <laughs> <laughs> good luck with that Perry Nemiroff I am on Twitter and Instagram at P Nemiroff and of course 
Collider, behind the scenes and bloopers. This Saturday, 2 p.m., it's going to involve a game. It's going to be messy. It's going to involve Comic-Con. You shouldn't miss it. Christian, Chocolate Chip Harloff. Yeah, you can find me binging Rocky this weekend, but when I'm not doing that, you can find me scaring Josh McCuga in VR. If you haven't watched that video, go and watch it. It was very funny, but just at Christian Harloff, Twitter and Instagram, and we'll see you on the Schmodown. He scares easily, often, so and funny. with the Yelp. Ashley Mova, where can the kids find you? Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Ashley Mova. Happy Wednesday, guys. Happy Hump Day, indeed. And last but not least, Wendy Lee Zaney. On YouTube at the Movie Couple channel, at Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. I am simply Mark Ellis at Mark Ellis Live for all upcoming stand-up comedy dates. Just go to MarkEllisLive.com. Tonight, Christian and I are back on the live show with the whole crew, 6 p.m. PST, the Schmoes No Live Show. Do you have something else yeah. to say? Well, there's a really big announcement on the Schmoes Show tonight, too. So try not to get spoiled because there's going to be something really big going on there. Tune in at 6 o'clock to 8 Big stuff happen. Well, you'll have to let me know what that is I at will. some point. I hope before the show goes live. We'll see you tomorrow. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider. Hey, what's up, sweaties? It's